Okay, folks, my name is uh, Ernest Braxton. I am a uh, neurosurgeon. I kind of um, asked some of my partners and my friends to put this together to talk a little bit about motion preservation surgery um, and how I can defy the aging process. Um, going over just a few of the uh, ground rules here. I think these, um, we're expecting almost 100 partic participants. It's just easiest as everybody just stays muted during the presentation. You can, chat, um, you can chat your questions. We welcome tons of questions. And you can chat it, chat it to the moderator, uh, Josh, who in introduced himself just a little bit ago, or you can send it to everyone. Um, also, if, if you just want like a doctor-to-doctor -doctor personal appointment, we can do that in person or in telehealth by calling 970-569-3240. Um, first off, I'm going to uh, introduce our panelist. Um, first is going to be Max Cedar. He's a fellow at the Stedman um, Institute. He specializes in shoulder replacement uh, surgery. He's literally in surgery right now. We're hoping he gets out of surgery so he can do his part of the talk. So we put him towards the end. Uh, next is going to be one of my uh, partners and good friends, uh, Dr. Nathan Kafferke. He's our adult reconstruction specialist, and he's going to talk a little bit about um, hip replacement surgery and uh, knee replacement surgery. And then um, the next person is a really close friend of mine, John Chef. Uh, we've worked together really closely over the last three years um, doing spine access and bringing that service to this part of the uh, country. Um, I couldn't do these operations without him. So, and he's gonna talk a little bit about, you know, what is a spine access surgeon? Why do I need a spine access surgeon? I don't wanna spoil his talk. And um, uh, let's get after it. So, um, you can't have a talk today about COVID, but I'm going to talk um, not about all the stuff you hear in the news, but how things are going on locally. We're going to talk about how degeneration can in impact natural movement um, and see what options may work best for your personal region of pain and talk about the next steps to get it fixed, hopefully. Um, so uh, you have to be under a rock to not have heard of the um, COVID-19 pa panic caused by the uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus. Um, I'm just going to uh, just put a public message out there that this tends to affect folks that are a little bit older in age with underlying health conditions, although it can affect the very young as well, as well as anyone. Um, but I have some good news. So the good news is that the cases in Eagle and Summit counties are decreasing and elective surgery is back. We've gone from a stay at home order to a safer at home order. And we're expecting a lot of those restrictions to, to be um, revisited and, and, and slowly eased up towards the end of the month. Um, we, uh, we are taking every precaution to make your surgery safer. And we now have readily available testing. Um, if, if we think it's um, necessary, if you wanna be tested, these are the places you can go to get tested. Uh, to make sure that you, you don't have the uh, virus and you're just uh, an asymptomatic carrier. So the next slide is, I'm just going to give you an overview. I'm going to tell you what you're going to hear before you hear it. Um, we're going to uh, talk a little about, about hips and knees. I'm going to talk about the neck and back. Um, Dr. Chef is going to talk about safely a uh, accessing the spine. And Max, if he makes it out of surgery, is going to talk about shoulder replacement surgery. And we have a special part. We have Josh going to go over a little bit about the physical therapy options. So um, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Uh, Nathan Kafferke. Oh. Let me just get you unmuted, Nate. Oh, there you go. All right, can you hear me okay? Ernie, can you hear me? I hear you just fine. Everybody else is muted, I think. Okay, perfect. All right, so uh, I'm Dr. Nathan Kafferke, and uh, just appreciate everyone uh, coming to this virtual uh, conference today uh, that Dr. Braxton has uh, generously hosted for all of us. And I uh, just want to talk about what we do with hip and knee reconstruction, how we can help defy the aging process and keep you active through through the golden years and into, uh, you know, maintain a very active lifestyle. So uh, next slide, Ernie, for me. <clears throat> I'm going, I'm trying to advance it. There you go. So a little bit about me. Um, so I'm a board certified and fellowship trained orthopedic surgeon. And uh, overall, my vision for total joints is to improve patient experience and outcomes through individualized patient care and technology. 
Um, and throughout my background, I've had the pleasure uh, uh, and honor of working with some uh, very uh, uh, successful organizations from Vail Health and Vail Summit Orthopedics with the US Ski Team, um, of some local high schools and Team Summit Colorado. And then I've become a consultant for uh, Zimmer Biomet and Conformis, which are two big uh, uh, total joint companies. Next slide for me. And so today we're going to talk about what uh, adult reconstruction is. We're going to talk about the three major causes of arthritis uh, that, that affects our joints. Uh, we're going to talk about a brief history of adult reconstruction, where we started and where we are today. Uh, we're going to talk over some of the uh, non-operative and, op and operative treatments. We're going to talk about some of the new advancements that we're doing here uh, at Vail Some Orthopedics and Vail Health to take care of uh, your painful hip and knee joints. Uh, we'll show a couple cases and then we'll wrap up the talk at the end there. Uh, so again, adult reconstruction is really an orthopedic subspecialty that focuses on the surgical treatment of painful arthritic and knee conditions. Next slide. As it's also known as total joint replacement surgery. <clears throat> Next slide. So arthritis is really a, ge a generic term that describes the process in which our normal joint cartilage breaks down and that can result in painful swelling and deformity of the joint. There are three major categories. Um, go and hit the next button for me there. There's an inflammatory arthritis, which we all, we've all heard of rheumatoid arthritis, but also psoriasis that we see on skin can also cause psoriatic arthritis. And these are the generic forms of arthritis that we get to uh, sorry, genetic forms of arthritis that we get to thank mom and dad for. Next slide. <clears throat> There's also the wear and tear arthritis, the osteoarthritis, and this is really the curse of living an active lifestyle. In orthopedics, uh, sorry, in, in healthcare, we see two major lifestyle choices, people that, you know, are a little bit more sedentary and get diabetes, and then the people that are a little bit more athletic and get osteoarthritis. So uh, it is the wear and tear arthritis. And next, Ernie. <clears throat> Um, uh, I am trying. Okay. There we go. And then the next one is that post-traumatic arthritis. You can hit the next button there. And this is where that last ski run got you. You were heading down last run of the day, and unfortunately, you got injured, and it led to arthritis in the future. So those are the three major causes of arthritis that we take care of today in, in uh, total joint replacement surgery. Next slide, Ernie. So overall, the hip joint is really a ball and socket joint. These cartoons here represent kind of what a healthy joint looks like versus what a disease joint looks like. A healthy joint shows a nice, smooth, healthy ball and socket joint, and an arthritic joint is really broken down. It shows a lot of potholes uh, and uh, deformation of the joint. Next. Josh, I think we got a question out there. Was yeah, there... I just sent it to Nate via chat. I don't know if you wanted to answer afterwards or... Or not, but Pat was wondering if there's any uh, conflicts of stem cell treatments before surgery. Uh, not really. So what we do, know, uh, Pat, uh, thanks for the question. What we do know about stem cell therapy is that it's safe. Uh, there is some kind of uh, benefit as far as pain relief and so on, um, but it doesn't appear to regrow cartilage like we would hope it would. Once we get into the structural deformity, uh, the stem cells won't recorrect that structural deformity. So Typically, we're looking at joint replacement. Once we tip into that um, me mechanical structural issue, um, we typically would say you should wait three months between an injection and a joint replacement. I will say that that's mostly based off steroid studies, steroid injection studies. So we really don't know how long you have to wait between a stem cell injection and a total joint. But rule of thumb is the closer you get to three months, the safer, uh, the safer it is. But again, uh, stem cells, a lot of interest, a lot of excitement about stem cell therapy, but unfortunately, it doesn't appear to be uh, helping uh, the joints that are de uh, dealing with structural deformity. Thanks for the question, Pat. Hopefully that answered it. So next slide, Ernie, for me. <clears throat> so th this is a picture of a knee, a cartoon of a knee. Again, on the right side, I guess the left side of the screen uh, would be kind of what a healthy knee joint looks like. And as you can see, an arthritic joint is broken down and basically uh, destroyed with lots of osteophytes. Those are the bone growths that we see and a lot of uh, uh, cartilage loss. So we have this uh, denuded cartilage or, or denuded bone with lack of cartilage 
that is resulting in a lot of pain. And unfortunately, again, once we see these kind of joints, the stem cell therapy won't take care of that underlying structural issue. Uh, but it may give you some kind of pain relief for how long is somewhat to, uh, unknown. Next, per, uh, next slide. So you have joint pain, so now what? Well, now you have a couple options. You really have two, majors, two major options on the table. One is you can continue with the non-operative treatments that consists of physical therapy injections. And this is where steroid-based injections really have, uh, have shown a lot of benefit in the research. There's also some other aspects or other injections available to you like the visco supplementation or the Synvisc or the, the rooster cone injections that people ask about. And then we are starting to do more stem cell therapy, stem cell injections in this area as well. Um, but as I just alluded to, we don't see a lot of structural relief uh, from inje those injections, but we do see some pain relief that can happen from the stem cell therapies. Weight loss can be helpful. Remember, we're not asking people to lose tremendous amounts of weight, but for every pound we carry on our body, uh, about three times that amount of weight is felt across the hip and about four times that amount of weight is felt across the knee. So, Losing, you know, five pounds is equivalent to your knees feeling like you lost 20 pounds and your hips feeling like you lost 15 pounds. So losing a couple pounds can make you feel a little bit better. Uh, Anti-inflammatories like the Advils and the Leaves of the World can be helpful. And activity modifications, meaning if it helps you or if it hurts you, don't do it, do something else. And once we exhaust the non-surgical treatments, that's when we start talking about total joint replacement surgery. Next slide. Mm -hmm. And currently there's no medical cure for arthritis. So the good news is that's, that's how we all get to work together. Next slide. <clears throat> so uh, you can hit the next button again. So osteoarthritis and post-traumatic arthritis, again, lower impact exercises such as swimming and biking and elliptical machines, all these things are great to keep your joints moving. And the more you move a painful joint, actually the better it feels. Most people have some startup pain and say, oh, it hurts when I start moving it. But once they have been moving it, that pain gets better. So, and remember that the lower the impact, the, the uh, activity, the less painful forces you feel across the joint. So we want to keep our joints moving. And in reality, it's really use it or lose it mentality. Hit the next button for me, Ernie. <clears throat> next. And then next. So over-the-counter anti-inflammatories like Advil and Aleve, ibuprofen, Celebrex, all those things can be helpful. Narcotics can be helpful when the pain is severe, but remember narcotics do not treat the pain, or sorry, do not treat the arthritis, they only mask the pain. Uh, next slide. Hit next. <clears throat> next. Next. So overall, osteoarthritis and post-traumatic arthritis, really the interarticular inter injection options are really steroid and visco supplementation injections. Um, again, stem cell therapy is definitely new in the world of uh, arthritis. It definitely has more, uh, more literature to support it in the sports world. But once we get to arthritis, it's really still uh, somewhat of an unknown realm. Maintaining a healthy diet, such as you know, avoiding the sugary foods that can get you into trouble, uh, just trying to live a healthier lifestyle can be helpful. Next slide. And maintaining a healthy body weight, uh, what we call BMI, can also be helpful. Again, just trying to minimize how much weight we feel across the joint. Just losing a couple pounds can make your joints feel better. Next slide. So overall, once we exhaust the non-operative treatments, we can get into the operative management. And this is where I come into play. And we use three major companies, Zimmer Biomet, Conformis, Depew Synthes. We'll go over all of that and we'll explore some of the cases that we do here in Vail. Next slide. So to understand what we're doing today, you really have to appreciate where we came from. Over a hundred years ago, there was really minimal treatments for arthritis and most patients were somewhat left debilitated in wheelchairs or you know, needing a lot of family support to mobilize. Next slide. But over the last 150 years or so, we've done a lot in the uh, world of total joint replacement surgery on the hip side of things. Starting in 1891, uh, they were starting to uh, explore the idea of implanting ivory into the hip. Obviously, that wasn't great. So they started to uh, explore other alternative substances like glass in the 1925, 1925, and then started using more metal substances in the early 1950s. It wasn't until, until uh, Sir John Charnley in, in uh, England in the, the 1960s really came up with the modern low friction hip replacement. And if you look at the knee side of the history, back in the early, as early as the 1860s, 
uh, they started interposing soft tissue into the joint, trying to kind of buffer that painful arthritic area. And, you know, if you think about when x-rays first came out, which was really around uh, the 19th century, the fact they were doing this before x-ray was pretty incredible. Uh, in 1947, uh, the hinge knee replacement came out, and then we kind of advanced from there. In, uh, in New York City in 1973, Dr. Insull is known as the father of the modern, modern total knee replacement, and he came up with the total condylar prosthesis that replaces all three components. In no way would I compare myself to some of the legends in arthroplasty, but what we do today is vastly different than what we did in the 1960s and 1970s. A lot of us have family members that went through those surgeries that uh, you know, spent days in the hospital, and now we're able to do amazing things such as outpatient rapid recovery total joint surgery. With total hip replacements, for instance, we're doing a lot of minimally invasive direct anterior hip replacements, utilizing computer navigation and uh, rapid recovery protocols. And this is all covered by insurance carriers. And we know that greater than 90% of our total hip patients are now able uh, to meet safe discharge criteria in about 24 hours. And, you know, if you look at our knee replacements too, knee replacements are typically, honestly, a little bit more of a, uh, a, a more intense surgery and a more intense recovery, but we're still able to do some minimally invasive knee replacements with robotic and custom-made implants. Uh, we're utilizing the rapid recovery protocols, and again, this is all covered by insurance, and we know that with knee replacement patients, 80% of our patients today are now able to meet safe discharge criteria within 24 hours. Next paragraph, or next. So overall, outpatient total hips have really revolutionized how we take care of hip patients. As you can see in this x-ray here, this is a case we did a few months ago. Uh, this is a pleasant 64-year-old female with severe left hip osteoarthritis. Uh, the x-ray in the top half of the screen on the right side of the screen is actually her left hip joint. And so you can see that that's very, uh, very much arthritic, bone on bone. She's got these periarticular cysts. Uh, she's got uh, deformation of her femoral head. As compared to her right side, which is the left side of that x-ray, that right hip looks healthy with good joint space and a nice round femoral head. And so fast forward, we went and did a same day outpatient total hip replacement utilizing a, a direct anterior approach, a minimally invasive direct anterior approach, uh, where we do very minimal soft tissue uh, uh, cutting. We basically work through a window called an internervous plane between muscle groups, and thus the patients have minimal blood loss and faster recovery. It's pretty incredible how things have changed. And this lady went on to do great. Her post-operative x-rays at the bottom of the screen show what a, a, a nicely done direct anterior left total hip replacement can look like. And she was able to discharge home six hours after surgery. At six weeks post-op, she was reporting that she was about 90% recovered. And so I tell people, expect the first six weeks to be kind of the roughest phase for your recovery. But by about six weeks, you should be about 90% recovered moving forward, working on self-directed exercises, on strength, balance, and coordination, and getting back into sports. But overall, she was so happy with the pain relief she received that she was actually somewhat uh, emotional and tearing up in clinic, thanking me for how, how happy she was. And this is, why we do our, this is why we do our job, is to continue to help people. I'm sorry, is there a question out there? Yeah, I got a quick question. So you said that insurance covers outpatient surgery. Isn't it in their, the insurance company's best interest because outpatient surgery costs less? Absolutely. So outpatient surgery is definitely a cheaper option for the insurance companies. Um, so they're, they're, outpatient surgery doesn't necessarily mean you have to have it done at the surgery center, for instance. So some insurance carriers get a little bit worked up about whether it's done at a hospital or a surgery center, but everyone's motivated to get people home safely and efficiently because it is a cheaper expense for the, the insurance carriers. But the other thing is that we know that hospitals are kind of where sick people are. And we know that total joint patients typically aren't sick. So there's really not a lot of reason to be in the hospital um, with the exception that if your pain is too intense or medically there is an issue, obviously we would keep you. But we want people to get home because home is now safer uh, on average than the hospital given the, the situation around us. And overall, this is the newer technology that we're using. There's a lot of information on the screen, but the implant that we use uh, with what the navigation system looks like, and this is through a company called Depew. Depew has a long-standing history of uh, excellence in arthroplasty implants. They are a subdivision of Johnson & Johnson. Johnson & Johnson seems to have their hand in everything, um, but they do a wonderful job of, of uh, creating some amazing hip replacement uh, implants. And again, the minimally invasive total 
joint surgeries are turning uh, surgeries with all the tools we're using now, turning surgeries away from the art and moving it more into scientific out, uh, scientific approaches. Thus, we're able to improve our patient experience and outcomes. And again, less soft tissue trauma, so less pain, faster recovery. And overall, historically, 10% of our patients were dissatisfied uh, on the historic uh, registries. But overall, now with our newer technologies, we're seeing 95% of our patients reporting ex excellent outcomes to the point where they forget they even had a hip replacement. And that's, that's incredible. Next slide. Knee replacement surgery is definitely a somewhat of a different animal than hips. I enjoy doing both for different reasons, but they both are a little bit different as far as, you know, the recovery process and the experience because both joints are different. Over here, we have a 69-year-old male. On the left side of the screen, we see this hip knee ankle x-ray, uh, and it's somewhat shaded out there, but he does have severe right knee osteoarthritis. He was debilitated. <clears throat> and overall, we went and did a, a, a robotic-assisted right total knee arthroplasty, and he was uh, able to discharge home within about 20 hours. Remember, knee surgery is a little bit more intense than hip surgery, so we do see knee patients stick around a little bit longer than hip patients these days. But both, both camps can definitely, both patients can get home within about 24 hours. Um, at about six weeks, he was reporting um, an 80% recovery, which is uh, incredible considering that historically most patients uh, before this technology would report an 80% recovery at three months. He was reporting an 80% recovery at six weeks. And so he was working on strength, balance, and coordination. And one of the coolest things I ever did was I actually went and was able to ski with this gentleman six months after his surgery, and he was skiing better than I was, and he was uh, pain-free, which was incredible. So we're doing some pretty amazing things with these newer technologies. And uh, with, uh, again, the robot that you see in the top left corner of the screen with the implants. And then we have a newer company called Conformis, which is really customizing your implants to meet your anatomy. So again, we're moving away from the art of the surgery and turning it more into scientific surgery. Thus, we have the opportunity to improve patient outcomes and the experience. So again, less soft tissue trauma and more patients are, rep are reporting faster outcomes than ever before. Again, historically, total knee replacement patients would report about a 20% lingering dissatisfaction rate. With our current technologies and techniques, patients are reporting a greater than 90% satisfied outcome. Uh, so that means less than 10% risk of uh, dissatisfaction. Zimmer Biomed's really focused on their robotic technologies. Their implants are some of the best in the market. Uh, but again, they believe that you can scientifically recreate your knee through robotic personalization. Uh, Conformis is really a great implant company as well, but they believe that you can scientifically recreate your knee through customization. And that's with a preoperative CT scan where they customize and make your knee specifically for you. And with a robot, we're dealing with a, a robot that is able to do the same thing for you. So we have two different ways of doing knee replacements, and both are cutting edge and uh, amazing to see the patients do well. And again, we're, we're excited to be able to take care of anyone who needs our services. Next slide for me. So overall, last few questions, when should I have my joint replaced? Well, overall, it's a complex de decision. Uh, it's really a discussion between you and your family and your surgeon. You really wanna make sure you've tried and exhausted all the non-operative treatments first, but your body eventually will let you know when it's time. And remember, as a surgeon, I'm here to help you get where you want to go. Um, and overall, the other question we get is, what activities can you do with a hip replacement? Oh, I, was, I heard that you couldn't do things, and you know, I'm not supposed to do some activities. Well, overall, in today's world, we, we let you kind of get back to doing whatever you want to do. Now, if you never skied before a joint replacement, may not be a good time to pick up skiing after a joint replacement. But in reality, you can start golfing and skiing and biking and hiking and swimming and doing all these wonderful things. But again, we still want people to be cognizant that the higher demand sports like running sports and certain aggressive court sports are putting more impact on the artificial implant, thus it likely could fail sooner than we want it to. So we just ask patients to be thoughtful about their situation and, and just minimize how much aggressive impact sports they're, they're enjoying. Next paragraph. Dr. Captain, so overall, we what? Sorry, we have another question from Joanne. She was wondering, the two replacement options that you showed, are they both covered by insurance usually? So the Zimmer Biomet is. Conformis is a little bit more challenging based on your, on your insurance. 
Um, I think they're both great options, and I'd be happy to talk to you more about those options. Um, but Zimmer Biomed is covered by all insurance carriers, and Conformis is a little bit more hit and miss depending on who you have as your insurance carrier. Medicare, for instance, is happier to pay for um, Zimmer Biomed, but we can get Medicare to cover Conformis too. It just takes a few more steps. Uh, private payers are typically a little bit more generous, um, but again, it sometimes comes down to who your insurance carrier is. So what, the next question by Linda. Uh, hi, Linda, I hope you're doing well. Uh, what is the difference between a knee resurfacing and a knee replacement? Functionally, they're actually the same thing. Um, so oftentimes people misunderstand what the word replacement means. I've had some people ask me if I just cut out their knee and I put in a cadaver knee, and I, that's not really what we do. So what we do is we, uh, a knee replacement means we resurface the bony ends of the anatomy, the femur and the tibia, and we put in metal implants there, and we put a plastic bearing between the two metals to prevent metal rubbing on metal. So that's what a that's what a replacement is, and functionally they're synonymous with each other. Thank you for the question, Linda. <clears throat> so overall, total joints are better today than they've ever been. Patients are getting back to an awesome quality of life sooner. Rapid recovery protocols from our anesthetics that we use, our anesthesia team in Vail is amazing and doing some amazing uh, cutting edge uh, anesthetics for patients. Physical therapy is also an incredible uh, aspect of your recovery. And with what Josh does and his team at Avalanche Physical Therapy, it's been better than ever. Uh, newer technologies allow us to do more minimally invasive total hip and knee re uh, uh, replacement surgeries. And we're improving surgeries through customization of your own joint. And again, we're moving away from the art and moving towards science. And thus this allows me to improve your ability to and reproduce from case to case, your outcome. So people are doing well in a more reproducible fashion. And it's a team-oriented approach. So overall, people can do well, but we want to work together. And if you're not happy, I'm not happy. If you're happy, I'm happy. So we have a, we have a teamwork approach. We want to get you through this and get you happy. If you have any, any other questions, I, uh, I'd ask you to go to my website, nathancafferkeymd.com. It's right there at the bottom of your screen. Write that down. I'm sure that'll answer a lot more of your questions. I appreciate everyone's time tonight. Thank you, Dr. Braxton, for inviting me to join. Hey, Nate, will you stick around? I think there's another question. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, Therese says, you did a total knee on my left knee two years ago. Now my right knee probably needs it. What would be different now? Hi, Therese. <laughs> Good to hear from you. I hope you are well. <laughs> so uh, two years ago when we did your knee, we did a Zimmer Biomet knee replacement without the robot. You've done really well with your knee replacement, which is great. Um, remember, robotic surgery isn't, isn't, let me back up, robotic surgery is really looking to help those 20% of people that struggle, and we're trying to squeeze that number from 20% to 10% or less, and robotic surgery has the ability to do that. I think for you, since you've had a really good result with your initial knee replacement, when we do your other side, which I'd be happy to do for you, we can talk about this, but I think a robotic surgery may be a little faster recovery for you since it's less soft tissue trauma. And so that's what I'd recommend today. The anesthetics we're doing, the whole experience is actually revamped from two years ago. What we do today is actually different than uh, we did two years ago and, far, and vastly different than we did when I was a resident 10 years ago. So I appreciate your, your question. And I think Dale has a question. Uh, I had a total knee by, Dr., by Rick uh, 11 years ago. Is a repla replacement dramatically different today? It was a different brand. Right, so the implant company is actually the difference. So there's a lot of uh, generational advances in the biomaterials, so the implants and the plastics, the metal and the plastics, between the 80s, 90s, and early 2000s. They were just, every 10 years, a better, better implant understanding was coming out. In the last 10, 15 years, the implants haven't changed a whole lot because what we found is that the implants themselves are the best they've ever been, and they've tweaked a couple things when it comes to the plastic. But what we're really wondering is maybe the implants are great and maybe it's us as surgeons that can be better. And so that's why we're leaning towards technology. But the good news is, is that an implant you got 11 years ago, if it was done nicely, which I'm sure it was knowing the surgeon, you have a really about a 80% uh, chance that knee can make it 20 years. So a very good opportunity. It'll last you a very long time. Uh, Linda also asked a question. If someone needs a new knee replacement, so if someone needs a knee replacement, is VSON currently scheduling? And if so, how soon? Yes, we are scheduling. I, um, with the coronavirus, we did have to slow down for a couple weeks, but we've picked back up 
with uh, pretty significant energy, and we are um, taking care of a lot of patients right now. We are usually able to get people into the OR within about a month from the time we decide to do surgery. So if you are interested in having a knee replacement done and you, and you want to come talk to me in clinic or through a telehealth visit, I'd be happy to do that. And if we do feel surgery is the next step, we can probably get that done in about a four to six week time frame. Hey, that was a really great talk. Um, will you stick around if more questions come up? Absolutely. Sure. Happy. Really appreciate it. That was really great. So um, now we're going to switch over to another area of motion preservation. Uh, we don't have the 150 years of history that the um, hip and knee doctors do, but there is a newer technology in terms of replacing the cervical disc as well as the lumbar artificial disc. And I'm just going to give you an overview about those two different types of uh, surgery. So the question I have to ask you is, do you have neck and shoulder pain that lasts more than six weeks? Well, um, if, if it's felt conservative management and it's persistent for more than six weeks, um, cervical artificial discs are an, art, are an alternative to fusion. The arthroplasty or the motion preservation um, allows you to maintain your normal natural motion and also reduces the biomechanical stress that you have above and below um, that, um, that segment of your spine. Now, there are some caveats. You must be skeletally mature. We don't do this on kids because they're still growing. Um, generally 18 to 67. Um, and you really do need a, um, a surgeon's evaluation to make sure you don't have other problems besides the disc causing pain, like your uh, facet joints. If your facet joints are the cause of the pain, I'm gonna show you what those are, you, you, might, you might need a different procedure. And this is appropriate for both one and two level disease. So here's just an, uh, an anatomic uh, picture um, of the a normal spine over here on the left. And then when the discs degenerate, there's a whole cascade of degeneration, starting from just a torn, uh, a thinning of the disc, maybe some bone spurs, a, a tear in the disc to a bulging disc that might be pinching a nerve, or a full-on disc herniation. Th these things can all occur. Um, if, if left untreated, oftentimes these segments will go on to fuse on their own, but I'm finding that we can go in and intervene with an artificial disc. Now I was talking a little bit about these facet joints. So just like you have joints in your hands, there are joints in your neck that allow it to move. And they're, they're pictured here. And I would think of those like the hinges on your door. And if your facet joints are really degenerated from an arthritic process, putting in a, a new artificial disc with a bad facet joint is like changing the door without the hinges. So you may not be happy. So that's why everybody needs an individualized uh, evaluation to see if they're a candidate. This is, a, um, uh, I think, a great video that really demonstrates um, the difference between fusion and artificial disc. Now, when you're fused, it's not that you, you can't move your neck at all. You can still move your neck, but however, if you look at the red areas, there's more um, stress above and below the area that was fused. So that load gets transmitted. Um, that could mean a reoperation. We know that natural history is for degeneration, but we think that um, the fusion process may accelerate that degeneration. And that's one of the main reasons I took an interest in motion preservation surgery. Uh, I started doing this while I was in the military where we have a lot of young soldiers, airmen, and sailors that live really active lifestyles to keep us safe. And I didn't wanna fuse their neck and, and limit their ability to wear a Kevlar helmet or fly, fly in a jet or serve their country. So that's why we have, uh, that's where I kind of got really indoctrinated into doing artificial disc surgery. Um, I, I wanted to keep this not so granular, but I wanted to talk to a little bit about some of the studies. And a lot of people think of this technology as experimental. Well, it's actually been around for quite a long time. Um, this is, they're, they're publishing the 10-year data on this artificial disc. The seven-year data has already been published. And um, one of the highlights of that study is there is only a 5.3 rate of adjacent segment disease um, at, at the inferior level compared to 40% and patients that have had a fusion. And so we know that uh, regardless of whether or not you've had the surgery, there is gonna be degeneration. We call that the aging process. But it seems to be significantly less when you had motion preservation when compared to um, a fusion. And the other thing I like to highlight is people tend to go back to work sooner um, with an artificial disc. I think there, uh, the, the, the process of putting it in is actually uh, a little bit simpler than doing a fusion. And, and um, because of that, I think people feel more functional and more active. Um, 
that's an overview of artificial discs in the neck, but we also have a solution for um, back pain. And now back pain was always the hardest thing for a surgeon to treat. It's always the most difficult thing to treat. Um, everybody um, will either have back or neck pain, and if they don't have back or neck pain, they have dementia. So everybody gets these disorders if you live long enough. Um, lumbar artificial discs are also an alternative to fusion. The arthroplasty also preserves the motion in, in the spine. Patients also must be skeletally mature uh, and have treatment-resistant degenerative disc disease. And I didn't put an age limit on that because it's really individualized, but I would say the age is a little bit narrower. It's around 18 to 55, maybe up to 60, depending on what the facets look like in the back. And this is appropriate just for a single, uh, a single level uh, in my hands. I recommend just doing this for a single level. Dr. Braxton, uh, Dan had a question for you yeah. in the chat. Oh, Dan Fishman, my L5-S1 disc degenerated to the point that it's essentially gone some years ago. A surgeon suggested an artificial disc was dangerous uh, at, at a joint, likely slippage to cause more damage. Was that true then, and is it true now? Um, I think your surgeon may have been referring to an earlier generation of artificial disc that had a very, very rare instance where the plastic or the polyethylene could slip out. Now that rate was extremely low, far less than 1%. The latest generation has not seen any of those type of, types of problems. And I can talk to you a little bit more in detail. So um, was, it, was it true then? I don't know. I mean, I think, there, I think there, is, there was a perceived risk. I think it was very small. Is it true now? I'd say with the latest generation, it's not, it's, it's, it's not true. With a revision rate of far less than 1%. 1 uh, Texas back, put out a study looking at um, over 700 patients in seven years with all different types of generation discs being put in, and the revision rate was, um, was, was far less than 1%, less than seven. All right, well, that was a good question. Um, so with chronic back pain, with, with the neck, I said six weeks, you should suffer with, suffer with the neck pain, try conservative management with six weeks. But if you have pain for six months, a little bit longer for the back, um, and you start to evaluate your life, are you, are you having difficulty doing tasks around the house, the ability to, to work and be productive, playing with children or grandchildren? Does your spouse think you're grumpy all the time because your back is killing you? Do you not do activities? The test I like to do, ask my patients, is if Brad Pitt or Jennifer Aniston showed up and wanted to go on a walk or a hike and you said no because your back hurts, you might want to think about an artificial disc, okay? Gardening activities, being sexually active. If those, if those things are... are um, if you're not able to do those things because of back pain, I think it might be time to try an artificial disc. And you may have already been tried these kind of uh, procedures in the past, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory, physical therapy, um, TENS unit, that's transcutaneous um, electrical stimulation. It's not that common, but it's out there. Opioids, drug pumps, laminectomy, nerve blocks. This, it doesn't mean that you're not a candidate, you just need to be evaluated, okay? And talking about total disc, um, arthroplasty. Um, my model, although we do fusion operations, fusion operations are a great operation, especially in the setting of trauma or if the spine really needs to be reconstructed. Um, but if I can refuse to fuse, I do. I think if motion preservation is an option, I look for a reason not to do it, not a reason to do it. Um, because the fusion can increase the biomechanical stress in other parts of the spine. Um, the first generation was launched in 2004. Um, the, the most recent generation, launched in 2015, is FDA approved and it has long-term results. And we'll talk a little bit more about that um, in the coming slides. It's a treatment option for those with severe back pain that doesn't improve with non-operative therapy. So this can't be, um, you, you decided to do some yard work um, this weekend and now your back's hurting. That's not, that, that's not the right person. It's somebody with six months of severe back pain. Um, and the procedure is done through a small incision through your abdomen. And um, Dr. Chef is going to talk a little bit about that procedure. Um, the, the, the exciting things uh, coming up in the long-term studies are we're seeing um, large amounts of patients returning to work, greater than 80%, and um, patients stopping narcotics. The next slide is going to be um, a video, and I'll just narrate it. And it just shows you how it goes in. Um, Dr. Chef has a, a video of how we get there, but this is, this is what happens after we get there. So once the spine is exposed, we remove the disease and damage disc and put in the new implant. Um, the implant is a single step insertion. We don't have to assemble it in, in, 
in vivo like the previous generations. Um, the implant is designed to fit a number of different surfaces and it's coated with um, a roughened surface that allows for bony and growth. Because people ask me, well, if you're not using screws, how does it stand? Well, it stays in with friction and then it incorporates into your body. And that's why I ask people to um, avoid high stress and, uh, activities for at least eight to 12 weeks after surgery. But they're walking uh, the same day after surgery. Um, the disc tries to mimic um, normal uh, uh, biological activity um, with that high density polyethylene core or plastic, but I like to call it PT uh, polyethylene. And it, it, it sits within the two titanium pieces of metal, much the same way that Dr. Cafferty does a, a hip or, or shoulder oper operation. But uh, uh, unlike having you know, an 80% uh, chance that it will last 20 years, these are tested in, in a laboratory to 10, 100 million cycles. It's actually only evaluated for 80 million, but they're, they're estimated to, be, to last between 80 and 100 years because it's simply a different joint in the body. There's different um, um, hertzian contact stresses on this joint, and there's, um, uh, we, we expect to see far less wear debris. In other words, when you bend over, I gotta give credit to Dr. Cafferty, most of the motion comes from your hips, not from your back. Okay. Uh, this is a study looking at what we talked about, that adjacent segment disease. And this is really the scientific reason why I've adopted this, um, I adopted this treatment. The, the conventional fusion, uh, which I also perform fusions on the right patient, um, he does great. It does great. But after um, five years, you can see that there's more stress above and below. That's the reason why we call the back surgery, folks, because you'll be back. You'll be back for another operation uh, at the adjacent level. And in, in, in compiling several large series, they've seen uh, up to a threefold decrease in adjacent segment disease when compared to fusion. Um, I really like this slide. I mean, this is uh, one of the studies that we're working on. It's going to be published. It's in preparation for submission. Um, but one of the great slides was the, the amount of pain. And I think about when I look at this slide, I think of it as a mountain because I live up in the mountains. And up here in the, in, at the peak of the mountain, you're at a pain scale of eight, of eight out of 10, okay? And then you come down off the mountain after your surgery, and then at seven years, you're still off the, off the mountain. So it's seven years in Vail. Uh, you heard of seven years in Tibet? This is seven years in Vail. After you've had your artificial disc, we have durable, um, durable responses up to seven years. Um, and so, and when I took an interest with lumbar artificial disc, I decided we should try to report some of our findings to the rest of the community. And so we pooled a bunch of uh, experts in the area to look at, you know, are you seeing your patients return to work? Are you seeing your patients go off narcotic? And the overwhelming consensus was yes. Um, I like to use the ski symbols for what your activity should be after surgery. Most patients can ski greens and blues at, uh, six to 12 weeks uh, after surgery. Um, uh, after other, other types of surgery, they, you know, it could be even longer. But at six months, you're skiing diamonds, just like Dr. Cafferty's patient skiing black diamonds, skiing circles around them, okay? Um, return to work, uh, I, I said it was over 80, 80%, and it looks like 86% of folks are returning to work by three months. With That's full-time work, and the rest are doing part-time work. Uh, one flaw in the study is some people wanted to switch to part-time work or maybe they weren't able to get full-time work. But the vast majority of folks with, this, with, with these problems are returning to work. And the same thing was shown in, in our study with the vast majority uh, having people return to work in one to two, uh, a sedentary job in one to two weeks, physical labor work, you know, working at uh, Home Depot or Walmart at six weeks and work involving heavy lifting uh, at six to 12 weeks. And Dr. Braxton, uh, Dan wanted to know how long <clears throat> uh, after recovery would it take to return to golf? So golf puts a lot of uh, forces and stresses on your, on your back. And so, as I said, that roughened surface on the top of the disc needs to incorporate it to your body. That's a biological process that I cannot speed up. We can only sl um, slow it down um, by not living cleanly, you know, by like staying up late and drinking and wild women. That's going to slow that process down. But this rough and surface takes about three months to incorporate. Incorporate. So at three months, you should be back on the course. But I always tell my folks when you go on the on the course, um, 
you, sh you should try to golf about half of what you plan to, at least for the first time. And if you want, I can write you a special doctor's note to make the cup size a little bit larger on the golf course. So that, that, that can make your day a little bit better. Thanks for that question, Dan. So now I gotta tell you, this study has not been published yet. It's, it's uh, seven year data that's in preparation to be submitted to SPINE. They just recently published in December the five year data, but it's showing all the same things, decreased narcotic uses down to essentially zero, improved function dec and decreased disability, uh, and decreased adjacent segment disease. That's what I was talking about, those forces above and below the spine. Uh, re reduced, um, reduced pain and 86% um, returning to full-time work. So I talked about what we do when we get there, but I can't get there without an experienced surgeon. So is Dr. Sheff available to talk a little bit about spine access? Uh, thank, thank you, Dr. Braxton. Sure. Uh, thank, thank you yes. for, uh, for letting me uh, participate in, in this, uh, this community outreach opportunity. Um, basically, uh, I, I, I've tried to tackle a couple of the, the most commonly asked questions that I get, but um, just as an aside, and I think Dr. Braxton included this towards the end of his uh, slide set, um, you know, I maintain a website as well um, and really try to okay, keep it as up to date as possible to give patients as much information as possible to make educated decisions about, um, you know, future care and, and what procedure is right for them. Um, I've had the really distinct pleasure of um, working alongside Dr. Braxton now um, for the past several years. Uh, we actually served uh, in Afghanistan at the same time. We didn't find out till we met a few years back. Um, so uh, he's, he's a decorated Air Force neurosurgeon. I'm a lowly Navy surgeon. So um, that's kind of the relationship there. Um, but a lot of times uh, patients will come see me after they've been evaluated by Dr. Braxton, who's recommended a lumbar spine procedure from the front. And, and oftentimes people will ask me, well, what the heck? Why, why are we working on doing surgery on my back from the front? Um, Dr. Braxton can certainly delve into a lot of the, the details and benefits to you as a patient working on the front, but um, it sort of stands to reason there are a lot of uh, critical structures, precious real estate that lies between the skin and the spine when we're working uh, through the abdomen itself. So we find that a team approach um, using what we term a spinal access surgeon, which is my part of the Part of the contribution and the spine surgeon themselves provides the safest most efficient most effective operation um, to get you a great outcome at the end of the day um, really in this day and age pretty much anybody can be a spinal access surgeon um, a lot of subspecialties do these types of procedures i've chosen in my practice to make it the entirety of my focus um, so these are really the only procedures i do anymore on a daily basis and I, I, the reason I chose to do that is there are some complexities built into these types of procedures, namely moving blood vessels around and uh, off the spine, that I think really uh, mandate the highest level of proficiency uh, when doing these types of procedures. And the other thing um, that I, I believe Dr. Brax and I have certainly found in our own um, experience, and also looking back to our, our both our military histories, um, is, is working as a team. I, I think everybody wins in, in that circumstance. Um, you know, sometimes it helps to have a second set of eyes, second set of hands, and it at least offloads some of the stress of the operation. Um, but this really, the team approach really starts for us um, even before we step foot in the operating room. And that, that relies on a lot of conversation, dialogue, review of uh, imaging studies, et cetera. And what we try to do is ultimately come up with an individualized care plan for each patient. So we try to bring both of our expertise to bear, um, finding the best operation for, for each individual. So go to the next slide. Um, a lot of times I think patients wanna know, you know what, what, are the, what are the implications of having surgery on the spine from the front and are they a candidate for that? And really with my practice being predicated on um, anterior spinal access surgery, really the focus is on minimally invasive uh, spinal access surgery. And I do think that the, 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 uh, over the course of time developing proficiency um, in really trying to reduce uh, size of incision, limit tissue trauma, um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that here in a, in a second, what that means, but 
um, we find that that translates to overall better outcomes. Um, so that's a quicker recovery, quicker return to activities, like uh, the question of regarding golf and, and skiing and those things. Um, so uh, minimally invasive surgery um, really affects that directly. And in order to do minimally invasive surgery on the front of the spine, because of the critical structures we're working around, I think it requires a lot, a lot of detailed planning and preparation. Um, things I look for are, um, you know, uh, trying to avoid um, any situations with what we consider advanced vascular disease. Those are things like uh, aneurysms of the arteries um, or a significant narrowing of uh, the veins. Those things can be treated and resolved, and then you may be a candidate um, for minimally invasive anterior spine surgery. But we like to kind of have those things addressed uh, first and foremost. Uh, try to um, identify patients with limited prior abdominal surgeries. Um, you know, on my website, I have kind of a general list of, of things that can, can preclude anterior spine surgery. I would say that list is pretty short. Um, and uh, again, it's sort of one of those, if there's a will, there's a way. When, when we have a, a quality team working together, um, I think we can accomplish most things safely. And then generally speaking, we, we want you in good health. We want any other medical conditions managed um, effectively by your primary care doctor. And we're pretty vigilant about um, uh, checking for those types of things. So now to kind of jump forward, um, how, how is the exposure actually performed? Um, I, I really try to, to break down the procedure into sort of three major parts. I'm going to focus here on, the, on what we consider the spine access portion. And that, a lot of that involves moving blood vessels and other critical structures out of the way. Then we shift to the spine part of the procedure, which is Dr. Braxton's specialty, and then we close up the wound. Um, and I'll talk about that in, in a minute as well. All these procedures are done in the operating room, obviously under a general anesthetic. Um, so completely asleep uh, for a variety of reasons. And what we do is we try to localize the affected um, intervertebral disc levels um, before we start uh, surgery. That allows us to really pare down the absolute size of incision to what we absolutely need to get the job done. For a single level surgery, uh, disc arthroplasty, like we're discussing here today, um, typical size of the incision is about two to two and a half inches. That allows for adequate exposure of the spine and placement of the implant without, again, any unnecessary uh, surrounding tissue trauma. So typically, once we make a skin incision, um, there's uh, soft tissues under the skin that are divided with electrocautery to ensure that there's limited bleeding. And then this really here is a key step of, of the minimally invasive approach, which is what we call muscle splitting or muscle sparing. So the six pack muscle, the rectus muscle is the muscle you see there. We separate that muscle along its fibers. So the muscle's completely intact and completely functional after surgery. So once those muscle fibers are separated, it allows us to um, work down to the actual lining of the abdominal cavity called the peritoneum. We use this uh, specialized retractor system that allows us um, sort of a second set of hands to keep everything uh, safe, protected, and out of the way while we're working on the spine itself. And so once we um, are through that rectus abdominis muscle, um, typically we use that electrocautery to separate um, the remaining fascial planes that exist. And then this uh, sort of yellowish uh, uh, um, fatty area that you see now um, is called the peritoneum. And so that serves as sort of like a biologic blanket or barrier to protect your internal organs like the intestinal tract. What it effectively does is eliminates the risk of injury to things like the intestinal tract, um, which is really important. And allows us to really just shift the abdominal contents out of the way and immediately access the major blood vessels that lie directly on the spine. Um, the aorta, the inferior vena cava and the iliac veins and arteries are um, directly on the spine, uh, as well as the ureter, which is the drainage tube to the kidney, uh, from the kidney to the bladder, um, which you see kind of highlighted right there. And so once we shift those abdominal contents over, we're able to visualize the spine very well. Um, oftentimes there's small branches of blood vessels that need to be tied off or what we call ligated. But that effectively allows us excellent visualization of the spine allows Dr. Braxton to then um, proceed with, with the uh, disc replacement surgery. We can go on to the next slide, I think. Um, so next question, and it's, it's always sort of the elephant in the room, I think, when, when we as physicians are meeting with patients, is there, there's risk to every surgery that we do. Um, we take those risks very seriously. And again, we find that we can 
really keep these risks statistically to a very low rate um, when we're working as, as a team. Um, the, the biggest risk that uh, I bring up to all patients is the risk of bleeding because we do have to work in and around major blood vessels. Um, that risk, um, in our experience, is less than 1%, significantly less than 1%, and I quoted it at 0.1% in my practice. Um, it takes into consideration a lot of different factors, um, but we want to keep that number as close to zero as possible. As I mentioned, injury to the, the uh, bowel and the abdominal organs and such, um, while it's statistically less than 1%, it, it, we try to effectively keep it at zero by not ever violating the, the abdomen itself. Retrograde ejaculation is something that really applies to male patients only, but it's an important piece of the conversation when I'm, I'm seeing a, a male patient, particularly of reproductive age uh, and or interest. That's something that um, we have a lot of information content on you know, on my website. It's a, it's a little bit of an involved discussion, um, but uh, we we'll welcome any questions and um, offline questions as well. And then abdominal wall hernias are a risk, again, exceptionally low, um, but not zero. So I think kind of to, to summarize things, we can go to the next slide. You know, really what can you, what can you expect um, after surgery? Uh, you know, again, a lot of the questions center around, I've now had this major abdominal surgery, am I gonna be able to recover and get back to activity? So we wanna address the back pain, we wanna address your spine issues. Um, but then we also, um, I think by, by virtue of the technique that we use, um, want that abdominal surgery to really not hamper or limit your recovery at all. So muscles are going to be intact where they belong. Um, we've seen less pain as it compares to traditional open surgeries, particularly open back surgeries. Um, and really an earlier return to full activity. So getting back on the golf course, getting back on the ski slopes, we really see that as a priority. Um, and, and I think for us, Dr. Brax and myself, a you know, successful anterior spine surgery is being back to your normal self, your normal activity, your normal quality of life as soon as possible. So that's always our goal. So we thank you very much. We have a picture um, of one of our patients. Sure. That's the incision there. <clears throat> it's a yeah. little bit smaller than Dr. Caffrey's incision. <laughs> Not that it's a competition. <laughs> So my incisions are <laughs> about four and a half inches for hips. But that's, I got to admit, hearing Dr. Braxton and Dr. Chef talk, it's pretty incredible to see where spine surgery has, has gone. Uh, again, 10 years ago when I was on my spine service rotation, uh, we would have the general surgeons come in and do spine access for us. And they had, you know, patients would have a foot long incision sometimes. And then we do our spine fusions. And so with that being said, we've morphed away from all the things I learned 10 years ago into this pretty amazing space right. of minimally invasive technology. And it, I got to admit, Dr. Chef, that's incredible. You're able to do all that through such a small space, and especially with Dr. Braxton doing what he does. It's, it's just remarkable. Yeah. Um, I, I've had cases where it's actually, I have trouble getting the implant into the incision because <laughs> Dr. Chef, <laughs> we have words. <laughs> Um, so I just did a scan of the participants looking for Max, and I did not see him. I, Max, if you're out there, can you? Uh... So Max, Max sent us an email. He just started his last case, so I don't think he's going to be able to make it. Okay. Well, um, I'm not qualified to go through Max's slides, so I think what we'll do is um, maybe um, cut to um, the physical therapy uh, talk. Does that sound all right with everybody? Okay, so these are Max's slides. Oh, we have one other question, actually. Um, this is from Linda. Can any of the new scientific implants with a seminar appropriate for stenosis? For spinal stenosis? Is that question? That... Yes. So yeah, so there there are implants for um, spinal stenosis. They're, they've been around for a long time. I think the early generations were like X stop. And now there's, um, you know, newer, um, newer uh, generations of interspinous implants that can be done. My preference um, to treat spinal stenosis is just simply to, to take a small 18 millimeter um, um, retractor and just clean it out with a drill and microscope. Um, there's certainly implants, but if, if you can avoid putting in an implant in the body, I would, I would prefer to do that. 
and we have a really high rate of success doing this outpatient and awake um, um, uh, through this really small access hole. Um, it, it, we covered this a little bit at our last time in our talk. I'd be happy to talk in more detail in another visit. But yes, there are, the answer to your question, there are implants. I tend not to use them because I, I, I feel like with the microsurgical techniques that are out there, we can just go in and take a small drill and, and physically open up that space without leaving an implant. Does that answer your question for uh, Linda? That was a good question. Um, it was a really yeah. good, good question. Yes. Um, it looks like there's a, um, is there another question out there, Josh? Yeah, Katie, uh, since she was wondering, she, uh, someone had a micro discectomy and a re herniates, would uh, that be a candidate for a disc replacement? So the answer is absolutely yes. Um, I was just, I, I'm in a, um, a study group with other spine surgeons, and we're talking about what do we do when, the, when a disc herniation comes back. Backing things up a little bit, a disc herniation is when that soft piece of jelly that's, that cushions the spine comes out and injures a nerve. Most experts recommend the first line therapy is just to use those microsurgical techniques to remove that disc. However, it can come back. And then you, then you now have three options. And I'll tell you my favorite option. You could go back and do the same thing over again, expecting a different result. You know, go back in and try to do another microdiscectomy, clean it out, use, 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 utilizing those microsurgical techniques. It does involve beating up the nerve, working around scar tissue, which some surgeons don't like to do. I find it challenging. I enjoy doing that. Uh, um, the other technique, which is what the other surgeons in the, in the group were talking about, is doing um, a fusion operation, saying, well, their fusion operations are, are become so minimally invasive, it's not that big of a deal. And, it, and the short-term outcome is very good, as we talked about, for fusion. It's very good. It's a, it's a gold standard operation. But I'm worried about the long-term outcome. And I think of the difference between a micro disc, um, a fusion and an artificial disc, trying to decide between a, a Mercedes and a Tesla. The, both cars are gonna get to, if you're following the speed limit, you're gonna get to work at the same time if you're in a Mercedes or a Tesla. It doesn't matter, okay? Both cars can get you, to, get you to work on time and safely. The reason why you consider the newer technology in the Tesla is for the long-term benefit to the environment, your children and their children. Same thing for the artificial disc. You consider the artificial disc for the long-term benefit of not having to come back for a re-operation at the adjacent level. So absolutely, it's one of my favorite indications uh, for doing artificial disc is a recurrent disc herniation. Um, there is one caveat, you have to make sure that the index operation or the first operation, your surgeon, whether it was me or someone else, did not remove too much of the hinges or the facet joint, because you have to have an intact facet joint to, to be a good candidate for an artificial disc. Well, that's a good question. I, I, I thank Katie for that question. More, any more questions, uh, Josh? Yeah, uh, uh, Joyce has one. Are any of these back procedures available if there is already a fusion? So it, that's, that's, a, that's a stickier wicket. The answer is it depends. Um, uh, generally, if you're gonna do a hybrid construct and a hybrid construct is having an artificial disc and a fusion operation, I would recommend that to do that at the same time because there can be some challenges with going back in anteriorly, going back through the front as Dr. Chef can, can talk about um, a second time because those tissue planes are not always as um, easy to navigate around. Now, it really depends. Was the first, was the index operation the anterior fusion that came in from the left, now you're gonna put in an artificial disc from the right, I mean, uh, from the opposite side or vice versa, or was the fusion done posteriorly? So the answer is that's a very patient specific and surgeon specific question. The answer is yes, it can be done. Um, uh, if I was gonna do that, my preference was, would be to do that up front at the index operation, but it can be done. And one more question, Dr. Braxton. Um, Terry is wondering where you can find all this information for the slideshow so people can look at them later. Where is Rachel on the line? Rachel is in charge of our marketing department. She's <laughs> asked me to record this uh, session and she, uh, through great pains, will find a way to post it on social media, whether that's Facebook or Instagram or both. It will be posted. It does take some time. I think that we learned a lot from our first session. This is our second one in our series of community outreach talks, and we did get, get, it, get it posted online so you can watch it 
on YouTube or Facebook um, at your leisure. And then I have another question from Tabitha. Um, she says, Dr. Braxton, you have discussed many different spine surgeries. With what type of spine procedures do you see your patients happiest with their outcomes? Um, I'm going to answer, I'm going to answer that question with another question. My favorite procedure, people ask me, what's your favorite operation? It's when people have a great outcome, but I'm going to say, say I have the most patient ambassadors, patient ambassadors that are people that have had the surgery and they tell a friend and they volunteer to talk to other patients that, um, want to have surgery in the artificial disc. They're the most enthusiastic patients because remember I told you, I thought, I, I love artificial cervical discs too, but the cervical disc patients have only had pain for like six weeks. Um, you know, sometimes a little bit more. This, the lumbar artificial disc patients have had pain for at least six months and it's become disabling. To take somebody that's disabled, that's been told that there's nothing that be can done for their back pain and then to change their life in that way, I find extremely gratifying and they have a high rate of return to work and patient satisfaction. So I think it's hard to pick which one is the best, but I do think my lumbar artificial disc patients are extremely extremely happy because one they've been suffering for it for a longer period of time and i think the longer you suffer with something when when that pain is gone um um they 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 are really truly grateful for that shall we move on to a little bit of physical therapy sure yeah so um just wanted to be brief here but um, at least for us at Avalanche, we are open at all three clinics. We have clinics at Breckenridge Rec Center. That's where I work at Frisco. That's actually shares a lobby with uh, Vail Sound Orthopedics in Frisco. And then we also have another clinic in Silverthorne. Um, and we've been open for about six weeks now. Um, and we're trying to do the best we can to be safe with this whole COVID thing going on. Um, everyone's wearing masks. We're taking temperatures when people will show up. Um, and we're trying to keep socially distant and limit the amount of patients that can be in the clinic at one time. Um, but we have, we're starting to get people back to the door. People are more comfortable all the time. Um, we just want to kind of let everyone know uh, that we are back to work. And um, it's nice too to be back since elective surgeries are starting to happen again. So everyone can get treated and um, get people back to where they need to be. Uh, if you go to the next slide. Perfect. Um, so with Avalanche, it's, you know, what can physical therapy do for you? It's, conservative treatment that can help either prevent surgery, get you ready for surgery, or recover from surgery slash injury. Um, and we work um, with all the doctors, especially at uh, Vail Summit Orthopedics and Neurosurgery um, to make sure you, know, you have good continuity of care. So we're all on the same page. Um, you know, we'll send emails, call, text, whatever we need to do to make sure that um, we're all on the same page. And you know, everyone's goal is to avoid surgery, but if you have to have surgery, we get surgery and then um, get you back to where you need to be. Um, so we want to return you to the sport or active lifestyle quicker um, and improve your functional ability. Uh, you know, the best thing for me has been, you know, treating 93-year-old patients who are yelling at me to hurry up with physical therapy so they can go back to skiing. Everyone here um, is an athlete that wants to get back to what they want to do, and they want to get back quickly. So it's a nice challenge for us, and it's great that we can work with these doctors. And I think it was her duty to... Sorry, what was that? This what we got back was... Oh, and then uh, go ahead and go to the next slide. And then, so the therapists that we work with, um, you know, I think all of us are doctors of physical therapy. Um, we have our orthopedic certified specialists, which means we um, did extra schooling, got a test to show that we're um, specialists in all orthopedic injuries from head to toe. Uh, most of us have worked with professional athletes at X Games, Do Tour, USSA, FI, FIS competitions. That's a picture of me at the X Games this past year. Um, some of the tools that we use, uh, almost everyone is dry needling certified. We work with cupping, we have hypervolts, um, blood flow restriction training, we have traction units, we're movement specialists, um, and then also we have aquatic therapy here at the rec center, which even if you go to the Frisco Clinic or the uh, Silverthorne Clinic, you can come here for aquatic therapy. We do that on Thursdays when the rec center is open, and right now with the, um, everything with COVID, the rec center is not open um, to the public at this point, even though we are our clinic is open um, at the rec center. So just a quick uh, wrap up slide. You can uh, get more information at uh, Rocky Mountain ASA regarding spine access. That's uh, Dr. Chef's website. Dr. Cafferty just launched a really, really cool website. You should check it out. It's called Nathan Cafferty MD. It rolls off the tongue.com. Uh, 
And uh, of course, my website is Braxton uh, uh, MD. And I just want to take a chance to, to thank all of our faculty um, uh, presenters tonight. They're taking time away from their family in the evening. They're not getting paid from that. Paid for this. I don't know if you guys know this, but we're not paying you guys to, to do these talks. <laughs> and uh, just uh, really love having um, a multidisciplinary approach from physical therapy, uh, expert in adult um, reconstruction, uh, uh, spine access, and um, and, and it's just cool to have my friends. I gotta apologize. The OR is um, can be a, a very uh, uh, difficult mistress. I mean, they can it can go long, it can go short. And Max is uh, is still in the operating room. We'll try to get him out and and do his slides at another date later on in the future. We can maybe plan that out. Of course, this lecture will be recorded uh, for posterity and uh, post it on social media, maybe the Library of Congress, I'm crossing my fingers. Any other questions out there before we uh, wrap up? Uh, Pat, just wanted to say, uh, Dr. Braxton, you did a surgery in February, 2018. Um, it's complex of his L4, L5 is no longer connected. He had a fusion with a new titanium disc. Since his trauma is probably over a year or more, um, he's doing really well and can ski some black diamonds at age 69. Uh, he said he did PT before and after, and he's doing really great, and he really thanks you. Oh, thank you. So that was not a paid endorsement. We really thank you so much. I'm, I'm glad you're doing okay. And uh, probably skiing better than I am. I didn't ski much this year because of COVID, but hopefully we can get out there next year. That's great. Well, if there's no more questions, I thank everybody for their attention. I, I thank my... Uh, uh, faculty uh, panel. I thank Rachel for helping putting everything together and um, uh, give us feedback. If you want us to do more of these, we certainly can. I, uh, I enjoy them. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. <clears throat>